Hi guys, welcome in. Today we're going to be talking about standard deck brewing, how we make our decks, and how to help you make yours. I'm Jason. I'm Keaton. This is Riley. And, and this, this is, is Velvet, Velvet Games. Games. So guys, let's talk about deck brewing. Like, how do you guys brew your own decks? What's your guys' methods? There is so much, so, so much to talk. Like, you got to be more specific. There is so much. So, like, when I start, like, I sit down. Yeah, when you sit down. Okay, I sit down, right? I think, like, well, for example, from you, I just ripped your idea. <laughs> it wasn't even well, yeah. deck building. You usually rip my ideas off, I know. But when but you don't have to rip off my when ideas. When I don't do that, what I usually do is I'll look at, like, a deck that's doing really good. And I'll look at, like, if there's a core that is, like, driving that deck. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, I use it in Pioneer at the moment, um, the Cat Oven deck. Yep. I just took the core of the Cat Oven deck. It's really strong, really stable, consistent, solid damage, has a sacrifice side to it. And, you know, there's a couple other cards I found that go really well with that that nobody else uses. So it ended up being a really good, strong homebrew. Mm-hmm. So I do that in Standard, too. I'll look at something that's doing really good in Standard, and I'll see if there's a core that I can manipulate and make it into my own being because I'm, I'm just not a fan of net decking myself. It's just me personally. Yeah, I me either. Like... Not a huge fan of net decking. Whenever I build a standard deck, I will wait till a new set comes out, and I'll look at one specific card that I really, really like. I'm like, I want to play that card, so I'll build an entire deck around trying to get synergy for that one card. Like for example, that uh, blue black toxic deck. Yeah. That silly little two drop, give each opponent a poison counter or draw card. It's a, good, it's a good card. Good card. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I'll build a deck around this one card. So it's funny that you say that. So the blue bla- blue green deck that I'm, wor- I'm I'm playing with right now in standard, the Simic Toxic, uh, actually started from Prologue to Phyresis because my idea was I was going to play it blue red at first, and then I was going to make it like with Vin- uh, Vindictive Flame Stoker and all this other stuff, and then Galvanic Iteration to copy it and give bunch bunch of counter spells and I'm or a bunch of uh poison counters. I'm sure there's a way to make that work, right? But then I pulled a venerated rock priest and I was like, oh this is really good. And I was like, wait, there's so many green blue spells. And then I completely diverted from prologue to Phyresis to focus on venerated rock priest. And then I'm like, okay, well what targets what is something that does well targets? Storm Chaser Drake. Well I need four of those. Alright. Oh Ivy. Oh so I could copy the I- okay cool. So I need like three of those because it's a legendary creature. Then I just filled the whole deck with just, I at first it was just nonstop like, okay, target creature gets hexproof or indestructible or phases out. That's all the deck was. And then I found March of Burgeoning Life that targets a creature and gets the another creature with the same name and puts on some battlefield tapped. I was like, that's a win. That's a win con right there. That and is- Another venerated rep priest. Yeah, exactly. And so then I was like, wait, I don't even need to pay three mana for it. I could just pay one green, exile a green card from my hand, and go get it. So if I have two marches, one march literally pays for the other. Yes. So it's just like, cool. I'll just go win the game real quick by doing that. And then turn three, you have that, another rot priest, and then march, and you target both rot priests, and now they're already at six counters, and you're just like, cool, I'll just win the game next turn. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I mean... That's how I I deck. And then I also look up a bunch of YouTube videos. Like, I try not to net deck, like, straight from a website, but I, like, okay, what are some other ideas? So, like, uh, in that deck is Aspirant Ascent, where you give the creature plus one, plus three, and Toxic one. Yes. And so it's like, oh, that's a one drop. Okay. Well, my Storm Chaser Drake doesn't have Toxic, and neither does Ivy. So now I can give, you know, my Venerate Rot Priest, if I need to, flying to get around blockers and give another Toxic. Or I can target the Storm Chaser Drake, draw a card. Or I could target either one, and then with Ivy, Ivy gets toxic. So it just like it helps the deck flow with the toxic toxicity of it. And uh, that's just a, <laughs> that's just a, one of the examples I have recently. So when you guys are deck brewing, whether in Standard or Pioneer or whatever it may be, is there like a focus? Like you said, you look at a core. Right? Is there a card that you see and you're like, I want to build a deck around that, and then you start that, or how do, uh, how does that work when you really like the card? So <clears throat> you can either look at like one card, like for you it was Venerated Rot Priest. Mm-hmm. Um, for your deck, it was Prologue to Phoresis. Um, in my deck, it was just like a combination of things, like like a specific interaction. Like ah, I like this interaction. 
Yeah, like I like being able to sling spells. I like to always have mana available to me and be able to do things and benefit off of that more than just the card, hopefully. Like with uh, the Electrostatic Infantry and the you know Third Path Iconoclast and mm-hmm. Balmore and all that. It all works great together. When it's all together on the board, it's very synergistic. And then prior to that, um, when Meehook Masker was still in Standard, um, Oni Cult I saw in the uh, leaks when it, before it came out, and I was like, man, this is just like Cat Oven, mm-hmm. but a yep. little worse. It probably won't get banned. So I went ahead and built the deck. Very strong deck also. Um, and really, you just like what I do is I just go to gather and I sort by color, sort by whatever card type I'm looking for, type in like the word sacrifice, for example. And I've got everything I need right there. I just go mm-hmm. through, go through each of them. I'm looking for like a low curve, looking for preferably artifact. And then like a payoff for sacrificing it or for sacrificing something else. Yes. So like Honey Cult Anvil or the Dragon Engine. Experimental right. Synthesizer. Experimental Synthesizer. Gold Hound. Yeah. Right. So I'm glad you mentioned the curve too. When you guys are building that deck, what do you think as a top end of a curve, what is it that you're t- typically looking for in a standard deck? So it depends on what kind of deck I'm running. Mm-hmm. Earlier before I built this control po- poison control deck, I was playing Grixis Planeswalker uh, Super Friends. Sure. And my curve for that deck was five. Okay. So it's a higher end curve, but you run a bunch of removal, board wipes, things to handle creatures. But in my contr- poison control deck, it's, my curve is two. Mm. So it really just depends on what your what the core of your deck is, right? So if the core of your deck is cat oven, that's one CMC for both. You want a curve of two tops, maybe three for yeah. something fancy. Like I, at the time, it was the uh, mayhem it was three mayhem devil. Yeah, mayhem devil. Yeah. You you might stretch to four if you're running like spawn of mayhem as well, but that's like niche. That was just a me thing. Yeah, everything Very else was like that three was just or less. a me that thing. That was just a me thing. Nobody else played that in that deck. Quote it, put it on a t shirt. That's a me thing. <laughs> that's a that's a me. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. I I mean, most of the time when I'm looking at a curve for standard, I kind of think five is usually my limit. Again, it does depend on the deck. Like, I play uh, Just Guy Big, where you have one with the multiverse, Portal to Phyrexia, all these other things that, like, just dominate the field, but they're, like, nine, ten mana usually. Yeah, if you can cheat stuff out, then (laughs) you have an excuse for, oh, yeah, my my curve is eight, and then people look at you funny, like... Huh? Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, I get it out on turn two. (laughs) Yeah, actually, turn three, I got the one with the multiverse, so, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. Um, And you have cards like Fable the Mirror Breaker. Usually, if that can last a turn, that bumps your curve up pretty easily. It's two removal spells. Right. So, I mean, that's... It works out pretty well. Um... And then you have the opposite end where I build like mono red decks, and I'm like, my curve is two, nothing more than yeah. two. Well, it's mono red. Uh, yeah, I, I would say three, but it's, it depends. It depends like, on the season, right? Like yeah. standard right now, I think your curve. Your curve is three. I think, is three. Uh, maybe four, because like the the Phyrexian, the, the Solfim, and then Thunder Raiju and all that. Oh yeah, I forget about yeah. Thunder Raiju. I think uh, honestly, with the the meta right now, if you're building mono red, I think your curve has to be at most three. Because if you're waiting for Sulfum most of the time, that those mono red decks are already ahead of you. Or those mono re- black decks are just going to board wipe you by the time you get Sulfum out. So even if you are, like Sulfum's great, I think if you can, it, it could definitely be built around. But in the meta of things, I would stick to like three with Mechanized Warfare being the top or Chandra, you know, stuff like that. And just be like, cool, maybe one Sulfum at the top, but... I wouldn't go more than two at the most. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, again, it does depend on the deck. Uh, I say like a safe curve, no matter what, is like three, four. Three or four in standard, no matter what season it is, it's a pretty safe curve. Yeah. Even now, wherever there's so many one drops in standard, yeah. three and four is Grixis mid range. The curve is three. Yeah. And that was still is one of the top decks. Yeah. You're seeing decks like play faster. And, like, even though you have 50 minutes in a round, you're still sitting there for, like, 20 minutes half the time just being like, well, we won't play all three games. 
All right. All right. How's your day? You know, <laughs> like, sit there, go get a hot dog or right, something. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And there's that one control player in every LGS that just every like every LGS has one. I'll take 49 minutes and 49 seconds. Okay. All right. Yep. Oh, you're gonna concede? Oh, come on. We can go to game three. No. No. Like one, one, one. One, one, one. Every time. I can't. There. I. We're gonna go play. Today's a Friday night when we're recording this. We're gonna go play standard after this. And I can guarantee guarantee you within the first two rounds somebody's gonna draw and it's not gonna make any sense. It's stupid. You shouldn't draw. You should win or concede. Like that's <laughs> I, it. I feel like you should draw sometimes. Like I went to a few GPs and mm-hmm. I love getting the draw because you still get prizes if you're high enough. Sure. Okay. GPs, but like an LGS F and M is just like regular F and M. Like yeah, it's just like why? Come on, like you're messing up my tiebreakers, man. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. But I mean, I get it. it. If you draw, it happens. It's still a point. It is either side, but still a point. Well, it's better than if losing. If you're playing control, you have an excuse, right? You have every every interaction matters. You have to figure out which creature you're killing. But if you're playing a mid range deck. Just play the cards. Uh, ag- yeah, just play your cards. Just, right? yeah. You're playing I mean, an aggro deck, and you're sitting here mm-hmm. thinking about, do I play the Swift Spear, or do I play the Phoenix Chick? Just, just yeah. pick one. Just play yeah. the card. It doesn't yeah, matter. just pick they one. Both have haste. They, they both have haste. They both have haste for one right now. <laughs> yeah. Just play the card. And I, like in our another video that we put out, taboos and what not to do's, um, we haven't actually put it out yet but uh, while we were recording this, but hopefully you can go check that out while you're, after you watch this video. But um, we talk about not taking 20-minute long turns. And I and we we're kind of directed towards more commander format, but even in uh, we see it in standard way too often, where we literally have somebody sitting there going tenacious underdog yes. or yeah, reckless bankbuster. Bank yeah, like it's just like come on, dude, it's turn two. Just play the card. You know you're gonna play bankbuster. Just play the bankbuster. Let me kill it with my one little one drop destroy target artifact or abrade it. Like come on, get out of here. Yeah, it gets me heated. I don't yeah. like it. Um. So back to deck brewing. Right, right? that's we're, what we're talking about. We are supposed right. to talk about deck, deck brewing. Building. Yes. Um, when it comes to deck building, let's talk about lands a little bit. That can be tricky for some people. We talk, we have no the... No tap lands. I disagree. Well, okay. So if you're running a two color deck. Okay. Why are you running tap lands? Three colors is understandable because you have to have that tap land that taps for all three. Sure. Or even in sometimes in a two color deck, your turn one land, if it's in turn one, you don't have the requirements it enters tapped. Sure. But you shouldn't run lands that always enter tapped. So the, uh, what is the Rakdos tap land that I play? Or even, okay, Bloodfell Blo- Caves. Blood Caves, Blossoming Sands, right? Okay, so green, white, Blossoming Sands. Turn one, you play that. You don't have a turn, you don't have a turn one play anyways. So you okay, play 21. that. You have 21. You're technically winning the game at that point. And if it goes down to turns, you have more life and you can kind of survive a little bit more. If you're running a deck that has no turn one plays, mm-hmm. maybe you can kind of justify it. But I don't like lands that don't have the ability to enter untapped because if you're, especially in standard, turns mm-hmm. three and four are the most important turns in standard. Sure. If you play that third land where you that's that removal, that's your your fable the mirror breaker, and that land enters tapped, you're done. You're out. Your opponent immediately has the advantage over you. I can understand that for well, sure. Of course, we're we're both bad, and we're both playing tap lands, right? And then no, that's another. That's, that's like another a, we opened a pack of Jumpstart. We're playing Jumpstart right now. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. And I I would definitely recommend if you can avoid it, don't. But I mean, if it comes down to a budget thing, right? Definitely understandable. Okay, you can't afford all the haunted ridges and Fair uh, whatever the newest. What's the new black red lands? No clue. I don't know. It's on the screen and. Um, <laughs> That's what I just chalk it up to nowadays. Just it's on the screen. Um, but yeah, like stuff like that where like you have you don't always have the money to be able to do that. So you kind of have to rely on. Well, I'm running three tap lands. I'm running three bloodfell caves. But it's not the end of the world to run three of them. Now, if your whole deck is like all I have is tap lands, you have a problem. Yeah. yeah. For sure. um, and you're playing five color nonsense, and you shouldn't be. <laughs> right. But I, 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 I don't know. I don't remember. It was a Guildgate land. Do you remember when that was standard? When the Guildgate Guildgates? Deck? Yes. I Maze's End. Yeah. 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 People played Maze's End, and if I remember correctly, for a little bit, uh, World Week was standard. Yeah. Also, so you had access to the to the one drop artifact, Amulet of Vigor. 
Yep. If I'm remember, if I'm remembering correctly, was, was it World Wake Innistrad, RDR, RTR? Mm. Yeah. World Wake Innistrad. Yeah, RTR because RTR was the beginning of the whole Ravnica block. Yep. Yeah. So you did have access to, oh, my lands enter untapped, and there was five color control. Yep. Five yellow, five color gates was a deck. It was silly and it was fun to play against, but it was a deck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now we have five color legendaries with Joda, and that that's a deck now. Or um. The five, five color, color domain. Oops, Atraxa. Oops, Atraxa, yeah. There's a lot of ones. Five color uh, decks now. It's weird. It feels like it shouldn't be a thing. I love it. I Five color is my favorite color combination. <laughs> uh, I, I'm too... That's like asking a kid, what's your favorite color? Rainbow. Rainbow. <laughs> all of all, them. All of them. <laughs> no yeah, downside. Right? What, what's your no favorite downside. candy? All, all candy. Like I, I don't like choosing between, oh, can I play this? Or do I play this? No, give it... Let me do it all. Yeah, what, what color do you want to play? Is it in magic? All yeah. of them. <laughs> all of them. I'll put a waste in my five color. Oh I don't care. Go, go crazy. Can, yeah. Is waste yeah. legal? I feel like it should be legal, right? No, waste is not legal in standard. Like it, You feel like it should because it's a basic land, but... Uh, are snow lands basic lands? They are. Are they legal? But how it works no, is they're not legal. They're not legal. Yeah. It's, it's so true. technically in every set, they print basic lands. But not so snow lands. If for one reason... They don't print basic lands in a in a, like yeah. a, in an entire year. They go without printing basic lands. We'll have a standard set without basic lands. Yeah, they forget to print Good. mountains. Yeah. Red is gone. <laughs> Red is gone. gone. Amen. Could you imagine? <laughs> All of our decks would be no more. distraught. Like we'd just be like, "So wait, no more mono red? No, all even right. better, no islands. Let all the oh, green geez. players do whatever they want. They already can. They have all the cards to say. Don't yeah, can't that's be counted. exactly. That's yeah. true. Fair enough. You have a point. So back on to deck brewing, right? Right. Okay. Yes, deck brewing. Okay. So <laughs> um, step one, you've got your core. You got your core. Step two, you figure out like what your curve is, right? Yep. Step three, you've got your land base. Now that will really depend on your core and your um, your your curve is what I meant to say. Exactly. That's why so, you have to d- determine those two first. <clears throat> now it really depends on who you are, how risk management you're willing to take, given the situation. Um, me, my standard deck, the most expensive card is two mana and three in the sideboard. Okay. I run 18 lands, which That's is very risky. controversial. Definitely risky. However, I've got a lot of card draw. Right. So it's really like I'm playing like 19 to 20 if I get some good card draw. Sure. If you're which... cycling through your cards a lot, then, and if your CMC is low enough, I I don't see any problem with running 18 lands, especially if you don't, if your CMC is, your curve is two. Run eighteen lands. Yeah, like you don't you don't need to sit there and have five or six lands in a game. Like sometimes it's helpful, but for the most part, you have that fifth land. And you're like, okay, yeah, stop yeah. it. So I in my Simic Toxic, I run twenty one in on paper because I and I run nineteen on in Arena because the Shuffler sucks. But um. In paper, I run 21 because I don't have a whole lot of draw throughout the deck, and I need those lands to play those protection spells, and I have, like, the two drop, the because two is my curve on Arena, I, except for the corrupted, uh, curi- uh, what is it? Distorted Curiosity. Distorted Curiosity. But, but for the most part, you're playing that for one mana. Exactly. It is a three drop, but it's very rare that you're paying three mana. For How does it. this always happen to me? Oh, you stop dragging your arms across the table. You're scooting it forward. I guess so, yeah. I'm trying to talk with my hands, too. I'm, like, hearing clicks, too. I don't know if that's... Is someone, like, tapping their feet or something? I'm, I haven't been. No. It might be the creaky chairs. Maybe that. That's, that's yeah. probably it, yeah. Okay. I'm just hearing it occasionally. I was, like... I For a second, I, I, I can barely hear it, but I thought maybe, like, acorns were falling on the roof. I was, like... I don't think you'd hear that. No, it's it, definitely it me. Roof? It's the chair. Justin, what, what do we have on time right now? 22 minutes. Wow. wow. I feel like we've been talking a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. All right. Deck building. <laughs> we're about to like we'll try to wrap it up. Wrap it up soon. Yeah. Because we really don't have a whole lot yeah. left to talk about. <laughs> um, all right. We're going to do a little cut thing. I was like. Yeah. I, I come back. All right. And then we'll go back to what we're talking about. We're talking about the top of the curve. Simic toxic. Cool. Um, bet. So, yeah. Is, action. Action. Uh, the top of my curve is two. Except for the distorted curiosity and everything, and so like, again, we you usually pay one for that because you corrupted and everything like that. But I I run less lands because what I found was I'm always getting flooded when I don't need to be, 
And if I'm running too little of lands, I have nothing to do. So like my March of the Swirling Mist can't target anything if I can only pay one blue because I need to be able to target stuff with it, especially if I need to defend myself against that Tyrannix Rex across the field, which I experienced the last time I played FNM because he had a like, he had a green black and he was like, Venerate Rot Priest, Bloated Contaminator, Tyrannix Rex. And I'm just shake like, down heavy. Shake down heavy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, fight rig. If you watch these boom. videos, we love you, Julio. But <laughs> that's who he knows who he is. But it, we do love Julio. He's very nice, very, and he doesn't like, shove it in your face that he's about to destroy you but he does destroy it you. is like oh man <laughs> well, turn one nothing turn two nothing turn three here's a six four exactly yeah well it's refreshing right every fnm you probably see like the top tier whatever meta deck yeah and then, shieldred and then we get the... our guy and he's uh, green yeah I, lo- I love it i love and respect a, a solid <laughs> green player yeah sticks to it like i like to turn things sideways and that's the game yeah and he does it well. He does it very well. Um, so back to deck building. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, to kind of wrap up uh, the idea of a deck build, uh, last thing I think we should talk about is cards to fill around the core, right? And what I do specifically is I look for something that matches that exact thing that I'm looking for or protects that exact thing I'm looking for. So it just depends. So, like, that... that matches could be kill spells if you're running like the red uh black sar- sacrifice it could be like destroying opponents other stuff uh board wiping depending on the control deck so on and so forth so like i feel like that all filled, fits into this bubble of how do i fill around this core what do you guys think so if you're playing a mid-range deck and you have your core of for example uh fable the mirror breaker mm-hmm. you want removal yeah if you're playing your Toximic toxic deck, you you like the I, my thing is hexproof or I phase it out. In is it spell slinging? If your core is dudes that get bigger or do stuff based on casting spells, then the the core the thing that surrounds your core would be uh, I draw a card and then this happens, or I exile top two and then this happens. Right. If it just depends again on what you're playing. Yeah, I think it's also really important. Maybe not the entire deck or like a large portion, but you want to have some cards in there that maybe aren't targeting specific cards, but are mm-hmm. targeting specific play styles. So like, for example, my Pioneer deck, I've got, I'm really good against creature decks and I have the core of the engine is really good at stopping uh, control decks. So right. I think it's also really important to like, like look at what's doing good in the format examine those decks see like what is winning those games you know go out to your lgs play test see what is beating you Mm -hmm. and think of how you can maybe stop that and like put in the sideboard or even put in the main board if it's a huge problem yes absolutely like even though like Raylan and i we don't like net decking even jason we don't like net decking at all but you have to know what's being played right right? you don't want to show up to an fnm and you're running a play set of cut down and everybody's only running creatures with eight total power and toughness. Sure. Like that that's just a feel bad. Or you, you run negate in main board and it's a creature format. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So you, you definitely have to know what's being played. Right. I think um even cards like Spell Pierce, um, and then like Witness Protection, that was one that I fought so hard on of like I was against it for the longest time because it's I felt like it was slow. Yeah, as an enchantment. It just makes a 1-1. One, one. Yeah. It stops him from being good. But, like, in is it spell slinging? It is so incredibly strong. Right. Because your curve is so low, you have to have a way to stop a 4-5 shieldred. Right. And you can just one mana. It's a 1-1. One, one. Now what? Yeah, exactly. That's it. That's all. It's a 1-1. Yeah. Because one, one. on turn 4, they're usually tapping everything and throwing shieldred. I mean, now we have Phyrexian Obliterator, too, that you're just like, it's a 1-1. One, one. It's a 1-1. One, one. That's all. Yeah, it's it, say goodnight. Is it probably feels bad against an Obliterator? Right. Until you turn it into a 1-1. One, one. Exactly. Because you could turn it into a 1-1 one, one and then just play with fire or whatever. Yeah. And it's you fine. You don't have to really mess with it. You just leave it a 1-1. One, yeah. one. Swing through it. True. Yeah. And more than likely they're going to block with it. Yeah, but yeah. It dies and then um, whatever. But. I did, we did forget a little bit. One, one thing that we should talk about real quick is sideboards. Sideboards. And I think that goes into a lot of what you're saying too. Knowing your LGS. Like build the deck how you think is best to build the deck. But having that, okay... I know I'm going to go get spirits. All right, I should probably put this spirit hate in here. Or I know, like, the biggest thing is graveyard hate. 
That's the, I think that's the easiest thing to throw into your sideboard. And now in standard, they have Lantern of the Lost. One mana, throw it down, exile target card. Then pay one more mana at any time, and then you exile all graveyards and you draw a card. So, Pretty solid. So bye. if you were just going to go for like general standard, like for, for years to go from now, mm-hmm. uh, if you're running blue, negate's always going to be standard. Sure. Black, always run to rest in your sideboard. Okay. Uh, but for the most part, your sh- sideboard should always be interaction. Yeah. Not in, and then maybe like in one little section of your sideboard, it should be like a creature that this deck doesn't like. Yeah. Or a creature that look, kind of changes how the deck operates. Yeah. So in your Simic deck, you have the bloated contaminator in your sideboard. Yep. In my poison control deck, I have one of the uh, Voidwing hybrid in the mm-hmm. sideboard against control decks. Yeah. And then in my deck, I've got uh, the the Jin. The yeah, hottie gin. The hottie gin. I've got it only as a one of, but I've also got Erith. I forget. Yeah. I think that's the name, right? Yeah, Erith. Yeah, Erith. It's a. It's just a two three. Whenever you were to draw a card, instead you exile the top two, and you can play them until end of turn. So really, it's in there against control matchups where like I'm running out of gas, but I have that, and like oh no, I draw a consider. Now it's a reckless impulse. I just doubled my card draw. That's yes. true. Yeah, I think um, ultimately, like how I kind of break up my sideboard too is half interaction, half what else could this deck use? So, like, in my Simic Toxic, I have the Fading Hopes to get rid of. That's my Shieldred counter is, like, get out of here. Like, I'm not going to worry about that. And then I keep going with what I'm doing. Um, And then I have um, Vesuvian Duplomancy in there as well. So that's a four drop, which is two more than my curve. But because... It's so good with the deck because all I have to do is target a Rot Priest once and I make another one. And then I could target those yeah. and make another one and so on. It's basically a win con. But I, if I'm going, the only way I ever pull that out is if I'm going against a really slow uh, control deck. Mm-hmm. Or if I'm going against this like mid-range kind of aggro deck. So uh, kind of like a janky mid-range deck you'd bring in the Vesuvian Diplomancy. Exactly. And it's a one of in the sideboard because all I need is one. And if I get that out, I win the game pretty much. So, um, but yeah, and then the rest of it is just like your, your basic, uh, spell pierce. I don't run the gates because it, I feel like for my deck build specifically, it's a little too much on like too much mana for that. Cause I have the oh, other yeah. counter spell that works a lot better. I personally don't run the gates in standard standard right now because yeah. spell pierce is standard. Right. So yeah, spell pierce. Um, I thought about doing make disappears and I'm actually debating between, uh, negates or witness protection in the sideboard for this and I'm still playing with it because I like right now I have the graveyard hate which I really like to have because it gets rid of the tenacious underdogs I don't have to deal with it gets rid of anything like um, five color the, attracts the, recurring the attracts five color attracts the just guide nonsense that they bring them back the, the portal the portal yeah it just oh goes goodness, no and so I kind of like having that in sideboard, but at our LGS, we really don't see that a whole lot. We're That's mostly true. dealing with, like, aggro stuff. Um, and we might soon. There is a guy who was playing Bard class. Last night? Pioneer. So okay. it might happen. He's He looks like he's playing combo decks. So this right. is, like, a general for every deck that I build, no matter what colors it is. My sideboard looks like hand control mm-hmm. of some sort, okay. creature control, like a board wipe. So it's... Some, something that wipes the board, whether sure. it be creatures or whatever the, the set is very prominent. Sometimes it's Planeswalkers. And then just creatures. Creatures that do something different than what my main deck does. Yeah. Yeah, creatures are so good against, like, control-heavy decks. Because if you can flood the board, most of the time you can get by with just hitting them with damage rather than trying to have them counter everything you do. I'm looking at you. You know who I'm looking at. Stop it. Um, but yeah, I think that's how we kind of deck brew. If you guys have any questions for us or something you guys want to see specifically, leave us a comment down below. We'd love to answer those questions and let you know what we can, if we can help you out or not. Um, yeah, I think that's about it guys. Yes, sir. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a great day. I'm here with Jason. Uh, Jason, your opponents have been subscribing to Velvet Games. What do you have to say about that? I'll say they got something to look forward to at the Summer Smash. Why well, destroy them in the Summer Smash? Oh. Uh. 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 Make sure to like the video, comment on the video, and make sure you subscribe to the channel. Tag me in.
No, no, no. Now, give me some of this. Make sure you check out the Patreon, the Discord, and MindOverGames.com. We'll see you there. Like that? No, no. Uh.